You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. This episode brought to you by PetFlow, the leader in pet food and supplies. Is your pet stressed out? Does your pet need annual vaccines? Which pet is best for a child? Would you know if your dog was in pain? Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor, where you'll learn everything about keeping your pet healthy and happy. From pet care, pet meds and grooming, to pet food, pet insurance and dental care, this is the place to find out everything there is to know about pet wellness. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets because it's your pet. Health matters. Please welcome your pet doctor host, veterinary media consultant and veterinarian, Dr. Bernadine Cruz. The evening news is awash with intrigue and scandals from our nation's capital, but there's some behavior that America's elected officials should be ashamed of, their relations with animals. Who's looking out for the health and safety of America's animals and food? From the Farm Bill to animal welfare, food safety, conservation, and research. It's the American Veterinary Medical Association's Government Relations Division who's advocating behind the scenes for the needs of animals, people, and the environment. My guest is Dr. Mark Luchonic. He is director of the American Veterinary Medical Association. We'll discuss whether Washington gets a pause up or pause down on animal-related issues. We'll be right back after the short break. Please have a seat in the waiting room. The doctor will be with you shortly, right after these messages. Join the dog ring revolution. If you love your dog and want to take them everywhere you go, now you can with Dog Ring. Dog Ring is a hands-free way to include your dog in more activities and give you the freedom to take your dog almost anywhere. It's a safe and easy way to secure your dog. It clips around trees, posts, and poles in seconds. It's lightweight, portable, and strong. It has a free sliding leash which allows your dog to run around without getting tangled up. Perfect for parks, picnics, barbecues, camping, lounging outside, and furry fun adventures everywhere. Now you can be part of the Dog Ring Revolution. Visit thedogring.com and sign up for our Kickstarter campaign. Registration is now open. Go to thedogring.com. That's thedogring.com. It's the Daily Doorbusters from Pet Flow, the leader in pet food and supplies. Opportunity knocks every day with hundreds of products offered at huge, huge discounts. Up to 80% for your furry best friends. And delivered right to your door. Go to PetFlow.com slash Pet Dog. These deals last for one day only, so act fast. 150 brands to choose from. Pet food, treats, toys, and more items than you can shake a tail at. And get free shipping and orders of $39 or more. A new deal every day. Get your paw. On today's Pet Flow Daily Doorbusters deal, go to PetFlow.com slash PetDoc now. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to the Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio with Dr. Bernadine Cruz. The doctor is in and we'll see you now. Dr. Luchonic, thank you very much for being with us. I know you're in Washington, D.C., and you're busy. Yes, thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yes, we are very busy. While Congress is home, the GRD staff is still busy in Washington, D.C., working on issues that are important to the veterinary profession and to animal health and welfare. What I find is interesting is that many people would probably be surprised to know that there is a veterinary division such as yours and that there's really a need for it. Number one, how did you come as being a veterinarian to Washington, D.C. and being involved in government relations? That seems kind of a stretch. Well, it's actually very interesting work, and and I've, I'm one of those veterinarians who've had four different careers in my veterinary career, so I've been very blessed, and it really shows you the breadth of what veterinarians can do. I was in practice for a couple of years, then I was in research, and I was in pet food marketing, 
And then finally, this is my fourth job within my veterinary career. And I work here in Washington, D.C., advocating on behalf of the veterinary profession and veterinarians and animal welfare on Capitol Hill and in the executive branch, so agencies like the USDA. And what you find is veterinarians, with our training and our education, we have a lot of transferable skills. So when I was in practice, I did a lot of education about, you know, how to keep your pets healthy. And then when I was in marketing, I did a lot of education about the product that we were selling. And here in Washington, D.C., my main job is going up to Capitol Hill and educating members of Congress and their staff about our issues. And so it's just very transferable skills that go from one, one part of my career to another. And it's been very interesting. I've been here over 10 years now. So would people look at this government relations division, the American Veterinary Medical Association, somewhat as lobbyist? In truth, that's what we are. We are lobbyists. We have four lobbyists in my office, myself, and then I have three main lobbyists who are up on Capitol Hill a good part of the week. And we're, you know, federally registered lobbyists, so you can go look us up online if you want. You could look up and see what we're lobbying about. But I think that while we're lobbying and there's a negative connotation about lobbying, we all need lobbyists. And quite frankly, more of our job is spent educating members of Congress and their staff about the issues because they might not be experts in food animal production or they might not be experts in companion animal care, and they need experts from associations like the ABMA to go come up and talk to them about these issues and to educate them about these issues so they can make the most informed decisions when they're deciding to either support or not support a piece of legislation. So you are responsible for legislative agenda there at Washington, D.C. What are some of the legislative issues that are really hot topics right now? What's on the top of your agenda that you're really trying to educate our legislators about? Well, there's a couple of bills that we're trying to get passed this year, and among them are the Veterinary Medicine Mobility Act, the Prevent All Soaring Tactics Act, and then the farm bill is, is very important to the ABMA and, and especially to animal agriculture. And finally, we do a lot of work with appropriations, which is funding for programs, for research, and things like that. The Veterinary Medicine Mobility Act is our highest priority, and that bill is important to veterinarians because veterinarians, we use controlled substances in our practices, so things like ketamine or euthanasia solution. And as a result, we're we're all registered with the USDA. We all had places of registration with the USDA. Well, technically, according to the current USDA rules, veterinarians aren't allowed to bring those controlled substances away from where they're registered. So, you know as well as I do that veterinarians go out to farms, veterinarians go on house calls, and we need to have these drugs in order to be able to properly treat the animals and our patients. And so the Veterinary Medicine Mobility Act will let us do that. We'll codify the ability for veterinarians to bring these controlled substances out of our practices and to be able to use them on our patients when we go out on a farm call or on a house call. It seems counterintuitive for them not to allow this to happen. So is it just something that's been going on for an extended period of time and kind of fallen through the cracks? Or is there a new legislation they're saying, no, you know, because of access to these control drugs, it has to be in a locked up facility at all times. Where did it come from? Well, it was always part of the regulations of the Controlled Substances Act. However, in the past, the DEA has used what they call enforcement discretion. So I think the laws, when they were written, they really, you know, unfortunately didn't recognize, you know, what veterinarians do, that we don't just stay, many of us don't just stay in our practices, but we go out and practice on pets in a house or we go out to farms. And so we've been talking to the DEA about this for years, trying to get this corrected. This year, we've seen some activity in some of the DEA regional offices contacting veterinarians and expressing some concerns about them bringing these controlled substances out of their primary place of registration. And that's where we really decided, you know, they told us that they felt it needed a legislative fix. And we have two veterinarians in Congress right now who are very interested in working on this legislation with us. So we were able to get the bill introduced earlier this year in both the House and the Senate. 
It doesn't seem like it would sorry. have a large financial impact, and it should be one that just gets rubber stamped. And I think some of the people listening to this right now would go, all right, you know, it's for food animal people have, you know, this need for moving drugs around or they're taking care of horses. But I know even in my own area with cats and dogs, we do have veterinarians who have a mobile euthanasia service as well as just mobile veterinarians taking care of cats and dogs. And sometimes, yes, you need those medications. It's a no-brainer. Why hasn't this been passed yet? Well, that's what we find when we go up to talk to members of Congress and their staff. You know, when they look at us and they say this doesn't make sense to us, why is it this way? And so that's why the legislation in both the House and the Senate enjoys very broad bipartisan support. It hasn't been passed just because of, you know, Congress has been, you know, as you've read in the news and everything, there's a lot of controversy up in Congress. Some people would even say dysfunctional. But, you know, as a result, you know, getting laws passed is a little bit harder. It's a little bit harder to do. So what we do is we look we look at other pieces of legislation that have to be passed by Congress in a year or in, in a session. And we talk to the members and say, well, can we attach our bill to that bill that needs to be passed as an amendment. So we go in a number of ways to try to get the bill passed. I think ultimately because this bill does have such broad bipartisan support, because it's very common sense, because it doesn't cost the government anything, I think in the end we'll either get it attached as an amendment to another bill or get the bill passed as a standalone bill by the end of this session. But, you know, unfortunately, as you see in Washington, D.C., things move very slowly. And it's been especially that way for the past couple of years. And you have to be very patient to be a lobbyist in Washington, D.C. Mm, take a lot of Tums and just keep breathing and mm. relaxing. Because, yes, they do appear to be small children in a sandbox who don't play well together. Well, sometimes that's, you know, that's what it is. And the other thing is that our founding fathers made it very, very difficult to get legislation passed by the way they set up the House and the Senate. And as a result, you know, sometimes it takes, you know, two or three sessions of Congress to move a bill before you can, you can set up the support, before you can, you know, get committee support, committee hearings, markup, et cetera, and get it passed in both the Senate and the House. So our founding fathers made it difficult to pass a bill. And then when you have a Congress that just can't see eye to eye on many different issues, sometimes that makes it a little bit more difficult. You're very politically correct. I guess that's why you have your job. Speaking of politically correct, something that seems politically correct is the farm bill. That's something you're listening to the news and they keep talking about the farm bill. And I being a suburbanite, gee, I'm not really sure what the farm bill is. And then being a veterinarian, I know that there's legislation that's built into that that affects our profession. So please, Dr. Luchonic, do us a favor in several sentences. Tell us what's the farm bill and why should the American public be concerned with it? Because that, that's the farm and we're living in the city. Right. And the farm bill really is the bill that really helps to dictate farm policy on both plant and animal agriculture. And so this bill has you know numerous provisions in it that cover anything from research to food safety to it even includes a provision about veterinarians working in shortage situations. So it's having a farm bill passed is it very important for the agricultural industry. The other part of the farm bill, which you hear a lot about, is it has the SNAP program, or more commonly known as food stamps. So really, there's the farm bill component, which deals with plant and animal agriculture, and there's the nutrition component, which deals with, you know, essentially food stamps. So you have two components of this bill. As an urbanite or suburbanite, it's a very important bill from an agri- animal agriculture because it helps to set agricultural policy. And as I mentioned, it you know there's there's food safety, there's research programs, and everything like that that would help to make sure that we have a safe and secure food supply for our nation. 
And so it is quite important to suburbanite and urbanites. What we found over the years as generations are getting further and further away from the farm, you know, we're getting members of Congress that are further and further away from the farm and, and really don't understand both animal and plant agriculture. So that's one of our jobs is to get up on Capitol Hill and say, you know, here these provisions impact animal health food animal health and let us talk to you about these let us educate you about these provisions and why they are so important to keep food animals healthy and also to maintain a safe and healthy food supply you mentioned two things i thought was interesting one is animal health yes but also plant health and i think veterinarians thinking of plant health and food health maybe aren't one and the same. How do veterinarians, since you're educating us, uh, legislators as well as now the public listening, how do veterinarians affect food safety? Well, I think, you know, in in a number of different ways, you know, and really what it is, is it's from farm to fork. And we don't think of the veterinarian going on to the farm to treat a cow as affecting food safety, but a veterinarian going on the farm to treat a herd of cattle or to treat pigs or to treat chickens are keeping them healthy. And then, you know, we go from the farm, then we go on to the slaughterhouse where there are veterinarians that inspect the meat that from the slaughtered animals to make sure that there's no problems with it, to make sure that it's safe and it will be safe to eat. And then it continues down the line. So it's almost from a farm to fork where veterinarians are involved in all along the line in order to maintain food safety, especially in animal agriculture. Veterinarians also have, we're also trained in epidemiology. So if something does come up or a food safety issue comes up, we're able to go back with our training and find out what the source of that problem was so we can keep it from happening in the future. So veterinarians are very important in food safety and we have a number of veterinarians that work in the federal government in the USDA and in the FDA and in CDC whose jobs are to help maintain a safe food supply. And with global supply right now, it is amazing how something that you eat could have been grown overseas as it shipped in. Maybe the food was safe, but something that rode along with that particular supply of food, some parasite gets in there and it can affect our own health. It is amazing. And talking about shipping, I'll take a little bit of a side right now. We're talking right now with Dr. Mark Luchonik. He is director of the American Veterinary Medical Association's Government Relations Division right now. And he's talking about food safety and delivery. And we now have a new sponsor for the Pet Doctor Show, and it's PetFlow.com. They're the Internet's leader in pet food delivery services. PetFlow offers pet food and supplies from over 150 different leading brands, including prescription food and treats. And it's great because you can take advantage of a real, reliable delivery right to your door. They can even set up recurring shipments so you get the deliveries when you choose. And it's that's such a nice thing because how many of us have been caught in the middle of the night going, oh, dang, I'm out of food and need to run out to the store to get some food. They also have a really nice service, and it's a daily door busters. These are daily deals on hundreds of products up to 80% off. They have deals that last a day only, so you have to act fast and check back frequently. So now you can order from the comfort of your home. You save time and money. That's always so important. And there's no heavy lifting. comes right to the door. So go ahead, go to petflow.com forward slash pet doc. Use the code PETDOC and you get free shipping on orders above $39. Site-wide, no exclusions. Give them a try. I did. And I'm really glad I did. Dr. Luchonic, you were talking about this farm bill. And all right, we can see how food safety, animal safety is important. But something that's part of the provisions of the farm bill is animal fighting. How did animal fighting get into that? And what does this have to do with the farm bill? Well, again, the animal fighting bill it has to do exactly with that. You know, groups of folks who either take, you know, pit bulls or fighting cocks or whatever and fight them. And in many cases, there is a gambling component to it. And the AVMA has been very supportive of bills that would outlaw animal fighting because it's cruel and it's inhumane. And so over the years, we've been very supportive. There was a bill introduced this year, the Animal Fighting Prohibition Act, 
which would make it against the law to be a spectator at an animal fighting event. So not only are, have we strengthened the laws, and we're continuing to try to strengthen the laws against animal fighting, but also now we're saying if you're a spectator or if you, you know, drag a minor to an animal fighting event, then you also are you know, doing something illegal and, and will be prosecuted for that. So again, it's just trying to, to sort of tighten the noose on animal fighting so that hopefully Hopefully, at some point, there will be no more animal fighting. I'm sure you heard in the news recently, there was a fairly big bust of an animal fighting ring with pit bulls. And it's just, as I said, it's just something that's just not right. And as a society, we shouldn't really put up with. So the animal fighting bill that's in the farm bill will just help to do that. And how does it get in the farm bill? Well, again, I talked a little bit earlier about, you know, people introduce bills and you'd like to get it passed as a standalone bill, but sometimes if you see another bill, like the farm bill, that needs to be passed, you'll see if maybe you can get it amended to the farm bill, and then as the farm bill moves through the process, your amendment goes along with it, and that's what happened with this particular bill. What can people do to help push these bills along? Well, you know, that's you know a great question, and I think people need to contact their members of Congress to tell them that they support these bills. So members of Congress, especially in the House, are re-elected every two years. And when we go up on the Hill to talk about issues, many times they'll say, well, you know, what do the veterinarians in my district think? Or what do the people in my district think? So members of Congress want to hear from their constituents on the issues. They want to know where their constituents stand on these issues. So any one of these issues, whether it's animal fighting or it's our Veterinary Medicine Mobility Act, which is very important for pet owners, it's really, really important for your member of Congress to hear from you. So how could you do that? Well, one way is when they're home in the district, which they are right now, set up an appointment at one of their local offices and go and visit with them. And just go in and say, you know what, this Veterinary Medicine Mobility Act is very important to me because my veterinarian comes to my house and treats my dog because he gets very upset if I try to put him in the car. So tell them, you know, we want you to support this and here's why. Here's my personal story as to why I want you to support that. Also, many members of Congress have a town hall. You can go to a town hall meeting and get the congressman or the senator's ear about a particular issue. You can call their office in either Washington, D.C. or in the district. And then the other thing is you can email them. And the ABMA, if you go on to the ABMA advocacy part of our website, we actually have an action alert center that you can send an email to your member of Congress asking them to support, or in some cases when we're not supporting, a particular piece of legislation. So you can email your member of Congress and let them know how you feel about a particular interest. But the bottom line is, you know, you need to take that step. A lot of people get very frustrated with our political process and feel that, you know, they aren't part of it. But if they take that step and contact their member of Congress and let them know how they feel about the issues, the members really listen. They, as I mentioned, they want to know what their constituents think about the issues because, quite frankly, in the, in the House, they're running every two years. So if they don't stay in tune with where their constituents are, they're not going to be reelected. And in the Senate, they're reelected every six years. They need to hear from constituents. And in our case, our veterinarians, we ask them to contact their members of Congress. And in the case of the Veterinary Medicine Mobility Act, we've had over 20,000 contacts into members of Congress on that issue. And that's not just veterinarians, that's pet owners as well. And what I love about the avma.org's website is that it's really easy to navigate. You get an area that's an issue and concern to you. Like, oh, I didn't know that was you know right now in front of the house and they're looking at this particular bill. And gee, I'm not really sure who my representative is. It's really simple to find out who your representative is. And as I understand, emailing will hold as much sway as the old-fashioned snail mail for contacting them. Is that correct? Well, we've actually, you know, gone more to emailing than the snail mail, and just because it takes, now it takes anywhere from two to three weeks to get a snail mail to a member of Congress. And so we have gone to emailing, but again, email up on Capitol Hill has just gone, you know, they get millions of emails. And so when you send an email, you don't want to just send one that's, you know, a generic one. You want to send one where you personalize it. You say, you know what, Congressman, this issue is important to me and here's why. 
I have a dog in my dog, in the case of the Veterinary Medicine Mobility Act, I have a dog and my dog doesn't like to drive in the car. He gets very upset. So my veterinarian comes out to my house to treat my dog and he needs to be able to use the medications to properly treat him. So, you know, again, if you use email, that's great, but personalize it because then it will be looked at and you'll get a response from member of Congress if you personalize it. Great. Dr. Luchonic, you've been talking right now about things on the American bases, things that happen here at home. But veterinarians and also the AVMA are involved in conservation and environmental issues. I know one in particular that I think get a lot of people's attention right now is the House 39 Multinational Species Conservation Funds Reauthorization Act of 2013. That's easy to say, but that shows that veterinarians are concerned with what? Tell us what that bill is. Well, that bill will help to fund conservation efforts on certain species, species such as elephants, marine turtles, etc. And it's something that comes up for reauthorization, and the AVMA is very supportive of that because we need that funding to keep these species going. And so, you know, every year, every Congress, we're talking to members of Congress about both the authorizing bill and making sure that we try to get, you know, just because a bill is passed doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be funded as well. So not only getting, you know, continuing to get these programs authorized so that we can keep these species going, but also to make sure that they're appropriated or funded so that we can keep these species going. So, and you're correct, we have many different bills on our legislative agenda that deal with environmental or, or conservational issues, and it just shows you the breadth of what veterinary medicine is. We have many veterinarians involved in aquatic veterinary medicine. We have many veterinarians involved in wildlife veterinary medicine. So, you know, we are, we do keep an eye out for all these different types of bills. And, you know, with a bill like the um, conservation bill, we're very supportive of something like that. One other thing, this is very close to my heart, being a graduate for UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine, and I know that you came from University of Pennsylvania. The cost of veterinary education seems to be outstripping common sense. We know that professional schools do cost a lot of money, but please address what's happening with regard to student debt for veterinarians, because if they can't afford to become veterinarians, all of these other programs will fall by the wayside, taking care of human health, animal health, and environmental health. Sure, and that's, and quite frankly, it's not only in veterinary medicine, but we're seeing it in many of the professional schools as well as undergraduate tuition. So tuition has been increasing, and as a result, you know, students are taking more debt on to to be able to pay for their tuition. So the amount of debt that students have now have, I think uh, the AVMA estimates it's about $150,000 after they get out of veterinary school. Keeping that in mind, you know, the starting salary is usually between sixty dollars and $70,000. So when you have such a big debt load coming out of school with the starting salaries where they are, sometimes it's very difficult to pay off your student debt loan. And so we work with Congress to educate them about this. We do have a, a loan repayment program that we support, that we helped to get passed 10 years ago, and also that we go up to Congress for funding that would pay for loan repayment for veterinarians who decide to work in what they call designated shortage areas, so where there are no veterinarians. So when we look at the country, there are certain parts of our country which have animal populations, but there's no veterinarian close by to take care of those animals. So that's one way that we can help to address the student loan issue. And then the government also has some other programs that we're educating veterinary students about that will, you know, help them, their loan repayment type programs that will help to spread out their loan repayments. And then eventually, you know, at the end of a certain period, their debt would be forgiven. So the salaries are are not increasing as much as the debt load. So we have to find other ways to help veterinary students pay off this debt. So in Washington, D.C., we do a lot of work on, you know, education funding, funding for the loan repayment program, talking to Congress about the issues in veterinary medicine and why it's becoming, you know, why tuition is increasing and why student debt's going up. 
in hopes that at some point we could find some some way to help address the issue because long term it's just not sustainable to keep going at the rate that we're seeing. And I think the ABMA and, and our sister organization, the American Association of Veterinary Medical Colleges, are working very hard. That's a high priority for them to work to to help to, you know, try to keep tuition costs down as as well as try to keep the debt burden down on the students that are getting out of veterinary school. Dr. Mark Luchanik is Director of the Governmental Relations Division for the American Veterinary Medical Association. Dr. Luchanik, where can listeners go to stay current on what's happening, what's affecting them, and affecting the veterinarians who are helping to treat their pets? Well, we have a few ways you can do that. The easiest place is just to go to the ABMA website, www.abma.org, and click on the Advocacy button, and that'll take you to the Advocacy section of our website. And if you click on national issues, you'll see everything that the AVMA is working on here in Washington, D.C. And also that will also take you to our AVMA Advocacy newsletter, which you can sign up for. It would also take you to the AVMA CAN Action Alert Center, which is where you can find out information about your member of Congress. You can look at the, at the bills. You can look at some emails that we put up there to send to your member of Congress. And so that's really the easiest way. We also have an AVMA CAN. And Facebook page and where you know we alert members on what's going on here in Washington DC and so you can go to that ABMA CAM Facebook page as well and so those are really the two best ways to find out information about what we're doing what the ABMA is doing here in Washington DC and if they had any extra money that they wanted to donate to the American Veterinary Medical Association and to CAN I bet there's a way for them to do so is that correct there is, and actually, you know, we really suggest if they do, that they donate to our foundation, the American Veterinary Medical Foundation, and that's the foundation that's, you know, it's part of the ABMA, and that's the foundation, the charitable arm of the ABMA, and they take in contributions, and then they have certain things that they work on. With One of the things is they do a lot of work with disaster relief you know, getting our teams out there when there's a tornado or there's a hurricane. So, you know, I'm sure that they would appreciate any contributions that come along their way. And you can find out information about our American Veterinary Medical Foundation on the website as well. Great. Dr. Luchonic, thank you so much for being with us today. And thank you, listeners, for tuning in to The Pet Doctor. This is Dr. Bernadine Cruz. Yes, you've been listening to The Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week. We'll have more information on how to make you the best possible pet owner. Take care. Pets can be a wonderful addition to your life because they're a member of the family. Keeping them healthy and happy is important. Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor with veterinary media consultant and veterinarian, Dr. Bernadine Cruz. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile, or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets. The Pet Doctor, on demand every week, only on PetLifeRadio.com.